Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Teresa Soto. I'm Associate Director of Academic Programs at the Hammer Museum. I am joining you on the Hammer's virtual stage from my home in Los Angeles on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples to kick off this program, community, collaboration, and radical inclusion. Please note that this program is being recorded and will be available later on the Hammers website. This is the fourth iteration of the Hammers Reimagining the Museum program, a series of public conversations about the history and future of museums at a time when museums are being called upon to contend with racist legacies and present day exclusionary practices. This series is one of several initiatives that the Hammer has implemented to further our aims to dismantle colonialist histories and systems of oppression in museums, including ours. I will be joined today by an inspiring group of people. Our panelists are Ajwa Jones de Almeida, Director of Education at the Brooklyn Museum, artist and educator Raul Baltazar, Colored Girls Museum Director Vashtai Dubois, and arts education consultant and public program specialist Henri Latiel Watkins. After we hear from each panelist, we will be joined by my colleagues, fellow museum educators Tara Burns and Hallie Scott, who will kick off our Q&A. Feel free to use the Q&A box to pose questions to our panelists, which Tara and Hallie will share out during the Q&A portion. In the meantime, I invite you to use the chat to introduce yourselves if you haven't already and keep the conversation flowing with the larger community that has joined us today. You can also use the chat to ask any technical questions that my colleagues behind the scenes can help you with. Speaking of behind the scenes support, I wanna express my gratitude to Alexander Barrera, Robert Loveless, and the entire production and visitor experience team, as well as my curatorial colleagues who conceived of the Reimagining the Museum series, inviting us all to envision a better museum, an anti-racist museum together. In my role at the Hammer Museum, I am honored to work with and learn from five-year-olds as well as faculty with veterans, seniors, interns, medical students, and activists, with artists, art historians, and people who couldn't care less about art, as well as people who were told that their art, their voice is not valid. I choose to work in museums because I believe that museums have the potential to be places of inclusion, human connection, and infinite creative possibilities for everyone. Art museums are places that make visible an individual's unique perspective where you can connect with a complete stranger at a program or view an artwork that makes you feel seen. Museums at their best can go beyond these singular connections through community partnerships and programs customized to specific audiences. Museums can foster better places to live, work, create, and learn. Educators and museums are central to this work. Our work manifests the belief that museums are spaces with a civic responsibility to engage and uplift our many communities, not just those whose privileges have afforded them easy access to cultural spaces. And we have the expertise and skills to help break down the barriers limiting access for so many people. In order to engage people of all ages and backgrounds with exhibitions and museum spaces, we are trained in both content knowledge and child development in art interpretation and art history, and in facilitating courageous conversations. We have advanced teaching skills and cross-disciplinary critical and creative thinking skills so we can lead a variety of workshops for a variety of people and help people strengthen their own critical and creative thinking. With cultural competency and social awareness, we look for inequities within our communities and work together to achieve shared goals. For many museum educators, we are driven to seek out who has been excluded from traditional structures, to actively listen to them, to radically include. So why, at a time when our communities are facing unprecedented challenges and when museums are being called upon to combat oppressive practices, have museum educators and other public facing staff been disproportionately laid off and furloughed this past year? According to the American Alliance of Museums, in museums of all types across the country, 40% of layoffs due to the COVID-19 pandemic affected education staff. 
and according to a coalition of art museum educators called Advanced Museum Education Now, education department budgets on average have been cut by a debilitating 50%. It is important to note, this deep prioritization of education in museums didn't just happen a year ago. For decades, volunteers have been replacing or have long replaced highly trained education employees, demoting educational work to the quote, realm of the amateurs, as Lauren Kreutz wrote in her book, Cultivating Citizens. If those who teach in museums are paid employees, many of these positions are contract positions or part-time jobs, which by classification limits their work to a peripheral status. This is a precarious place to be in general, and especially during a crisis when museums need to make tough decisions about what or who they deem is essential. Yet when I hear stories from museum education colleagues across the country, I am deeply moved by just how essential our work is. I think of creating aging programs that offer seniors social connection, intellectual stimulation, and joy at a time of increased isolation. I think of educators who center teen perspectives from diverse communities and programs and exhibitions, strengthen their leadership skills and pay teens for their labor. I also think of educators who collaborate internally and externally to foster inclusion. At the Seattle Art Museum, educators and curators convene a community advisory group for every special exhibition, knowing that community expertise is beneficial. At the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, educators pivoted to working with collections installed in a local mall so they could continue to engage families with art and creative activities while the museum was closed. There are countless anecdotes of how museum educators create social impact. In this program, you'll hear from four panelists who will demonstrate how central community engagement and education should be to a museum's mission. Now I've asked each panelist to begin by sharing a pivotal program or initiative that they worked on that speaks to a meaningful intersection of museums and community. And with that, I'd like to invite our first panelist to join me on the Hammers virtual stage, Ajua Jones de Almeida. Ajua Jones de Almeida has been committed to using arts and culture as vehicles for social change throughout her career. She has founded multiple community-based organizations, including Sista de Sista, which supports young women of color in Brooklyn. In her current role as Director of Education at the Brooklyn Museum, she reimagines the role of museums in people's lives by expanding access to school partnerships, building pipelines for youth, and through innovative collaborations, centering the needs and perspectives of people of color and working class communities. I'm often asked for examples of museums that I think are doing incredible work with communities. And I always think of Adjua and what she and her team have been doing at the Brooklyn Museum. You can learn more about Adjua's accomplishments in the chat. Adjua, please share the program or initiative that you think speaks to a meaningful intersection of museums and community. Thanks, Teresa. Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. I'm going to start off answering this question by actually posing two quick counter questions, which are what communities and building a meaningful intersection for the sake of what? Um, and I start with this because I think that if we're interested in moving beyond optics and performative gestures, it's critical that we spend time as museums and cultural institutions defining what communities we're talking about and what our goals are in building partnerships. At the Education Division in the Brooklyn Museum, we've made an explicit commitment to center communities who have been historically ignored and devalued in museum spaces, including BIPOC, queer, gender non-conforming, immigrant, low-income and working class, and disabled communities. So centering community partnerships for the sake of strengthening movements committed to fighting racism, ableism, heteronormativity, classism, et cetera. And in order for these partnerships to be meaningful, it requires a shared understanding of how power works. So over the past five years, we've been engaged in a museum-wide investigation of anti-oppressive practices that have focused on an analysis of power and oppression and how it operates across four interrelated levels 
systemic things like healthcare, criminal justice system, housing, structural or institutional, interpersonal and internalized. So if we're interested in community partnerships that move us towards transformation across many of these levels, as many levels as possible, it's critical that we think creatively about who we partner with and that we seek out collaborators and stakeholders with expertise across multiple dimensions, across different dimensions even. So on this note, one really exciting recent example that we've been building since 2019 with a variety of partners has been Project Reset at the Brooklyn Museum. This is an arts-based diversion program for young adults ages 18 to 25, but also for older adults ages 26 and up who receive a desk appearance ticket for minor misdemeanors, things like jumping the turnstile, shoplifting, etc. And they are pre-screened and then offered the opportunity to participate in this two hour program in the museum after COVID hit, it went virtual. And after successfully completing their time, the DA declines to prosecute and they no longer have to go to court and there's nothing on their record. It's been an amazing collaboration with multiple stakeholders that represents a small but meaningful step towards reimagining what criminal justice reform can look like and emphasizing the potential that can happen with individuals are given time for reflection inspiration critical dialogue with each other creative expression as opposed to just a purely punitive approach it also allows the museum to reimagine the role that it can play in people's lives beyond just going for an aesthetic experience. What other ways can we activate museum spaces to have real impactful lived experiences beyond just um, a kind of a personal aesthetic um, kind of experience and which is fine and important, but there's so many other things that we can tap into um, by through strategic partnerships. I want to shout out um, Sean Leonardo, Derek Forger, who are the kind of founding artists who uh, conceptualize some of the key ingredients of this partnership. At the Brooklyn Museum, I want to shout out adult learning manager Monica Marino who worked with artist Craig Blue in developing the sessions for the older segment of adults. And I wanna shout out uh, teaching artist Sophia Dawson and artist Sophia Dawson who partner with team programs manager, Lindsay C. Harris to work with the younger adults. On the criminal justice side of things, we work with the Brooklyn District Attorney um, Office, Eric Gonzalez and his office, also the Center for Court Innovation, which is a, a New York based nonprofit focused on criminal justice reform and the Brooklyn Justice Initiative. Special shout out also to Aaron Charlotte Powers, formerly of CCI, who first brought this opportunity to the Brooklyn Museum. I also want to shout out our curators, uh, Eugenie Tsai, sen Senior Curator of Contemporary Art and Jane Deeney, Senior Curator of American Art, because they've been really critical in pushing for diversification of our American Arts Gallery, of our contemporary uh, collection, which is another critical piece of the equation, right? Diversifying the collection so that there's more opportunities for these critical conversations, for people to see themselves reflected so that we can activate museum spaces in all these incredible new multidimensional um, ways. So I may be out of time here in my, in my five minutes, but I just wanted to end by saying that thinking about these realms of action, museum educators, as Teresa so brilliantly kind of put out there, the work that we do in our ability to build critical nuanced conversation that's not overly didactic, that allows for people to show up fully as they are and to be moved by the dynamic of the space, that's one realm of action. The folks who have expertise dealing with the actual criminal justice system and social workers and art therapists, that's a whole other domain. And the possibilities for creatively thinking about how you can bring together these multiple um, kind of arenas of action can lead to really transformative um, reimaginings both for these systems that feel so huge and, and, and kind of um, dense, like we can find cracks in them, 
but also for museums in this critical moment for us to really reimagine what we can do and how we can show up in both in society and communities and in people's lives. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Teresa so that we can also hear from some of our other uh, panelists. Thank you so much, Adjua. Project Research, uh, Reset is such an inspiring program. Thanks for sharing all of that. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you again soon. I'd like to bring up our next panelist, Henri Latiel Watkins. Henri Latiel Watkins, also known as, a, as the liberation music maker, is an educator, musician, producer, activist, and a mentor to many youth in Washington, DC and beyond. Through her music, she uplifts her audience and collaborators by remixing liberation chants and sounds from Black Lives Matter protests. She applies her remixing skills outside of music as well, capturing everyday moments of Black joy and turning them into transformational programming and arts institutions. Soon to join the Smithsonian's Race, Community, and Our Shared Future initiative, Henri was previously the senior manager of teen programs at the Hirshhorn Museum. She is also the founder of two grassroots programs rooted in the arts, technology, and racial and gender equity, the Black Girls Hand Games Project and Freedom Futures Collective. You can read more about Henri in the chat. Henri, what meaningful intersections of museums and community would you like to share with us today? Peace, everyone. Hi everyone, my name is Unre Latiel Watkins. I'm so happy to be here with you all. All of my educators, I just want y'all to drop some affirming words into this chat because I mean, what's up? Without educators in museums or any education space for that matter, museums would be so whack. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> well, my name is Unre. I am an education consultant. Um, I support local and national organizations by, um, so by helping them to create more equitable, sustainable, accessible, and inclusive programs for youth, um, particularly for youth that sit furthest on the margins, um, Black and Brown youth to be exact. And I spent the last few years working at the Smithsonian's Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden as their senior manager of team programs and a manager of their digital art studio for teens, Art Lab. Art Lab is a wonderland of digital art and technology, an after school space for teens 13 to 19 years of age to hang out, commune with their homies, um, to mess around or, and or tinker with equipment or geek out. And when we say geek out, we mean taking themselves to this deeper level of innovation um, and learning using 21st century technology and the support of artist mentors um, or artist educators in the space. Um, we ask for youth to come in as they are. Um, come in and deem what your learning experience and your learning journey looks like. For you, it is a very interest-driven space. Whatever you are interested in is what we are interested in bringing to the table to support you in your learning journey. Um, and so the if we could actually go back to the previous picture. So you'll notice that in this picture you see about, mm, I don't know, there's about five or six youth here. Um, historically, Art Lab has been a very cisgendered, cisgendered male, cisgendered male dominated space. And so I wanted to come in and to expand the representation of gender in the space. When we think about intersectionality, you know, I'm sitting here like, okay, I'm serving black and brown youth, but I also understand that marginalized communities experience unique um, levels of oppression based on the category that we're speaking about, whether it's class, whether it's race, um, disabilities, gender, sexual orientation. So I'm like, yo, Let's tackle gender. Let's take this one step at a time, all right? And so we created a program. If we can go to the next slide. We created a program called The Salon. And this was my way of being able to target Black girls, um, Black and brown girls, Black and brown femmes, and Black and brown gender expansive youth. And the program was really this deep-seated exploration of Black hair and Black hair culture in the city. We gave 14 youth the opportunity to come in and to learn skills in film production um, and to create a documentary that was dedicated to the Black hair community in DC. 
And the program culminated in an exhibition where we was like, yo, we about to go into the Hirshhorn and we about to just take over. We about to completely take over this space and we're going to transform this space into a black hair salon. Let me repeat myself. We transformed the Hirshhorn into a black hair salon. Y'all, it was wild. It was lit. It was black. It was just like magical. And so I want to actually give you all an opportunity to see what that looks like and talk you through that experience. If we can go to the video, please. Hey, 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 give it, give it. <laughs> Shout out to Janine around the beat. Yo, so look, this was just like extraordinary. When we opened the doors at six o'clock, um, we had families, black women, black girls, black people, um, all people, but mostly black people. Um, at the doors waiting to get in. Um, we basically set up live uh, nail parlors. There were individuals that were that were twisting locks. Um, there were black hair salon owners that were in the space. So many vendors. You'll have see a moment where we actually have like, um, the wigs where you can actually try on the wig. You see this woman just getting her entire life. This person getting her entire life. Um, and we had Crozilla. If you all are familiar, Crozilla is an interdisciplinary artist who is known for her work with Solange, um, creating these beautiful hair pieces and hair installations. And this is her right here, um, actually grading one of the students who created a documentary centering Black hair and Black culture in the city. Um, <laughs> you know, Black vendors that have dedicated themselves to Black hair culture. Um, and you know, and for me, my biggest thing is I want our youth to always, I, I wanted our youth to always feel like, yo, we're not just producing this film and showing it to our family and friends. Yo, we are showing this to the entire community. And so when we were able to host this program, y'all, I lied to you not, we put our tickets out and we were able to bring in nearly 2000 people to this event, which is, it was a big deal for us. These these black girls, I mean, come on, come on. Um, and it was just such a phenomenal experience. Um, we had a chance to, to interview Alelia Bundles, the great the great granddaughter of Manasseh Day Walker, um, put uh, one of our youth on stage with so many different, um, with, with Crozilla and so many different local hair salon owners. This is me at the end. <laughs> and yo, it was just such a super amazing community driven experience. Something that I've recognized, and I hope that you all recognize this too, is that it's hard to bring in 2000 youth into the space, right? But you can offer opportunities that are youth centric, that are youth driven, that's going to impact, impact the community. Um, and so while we may not be able to bring, or we all may not be able to bring 2000 youth into our space, we can certainly bring those youth their families, their friends, their community members, um, millennials, those who are interested in, in this instance, black hair and black hair culture, right? Um, and so it was it was amazing. Um, I hope that you all are inspired um, to think big um, and we're inspired by um, this video, this program. And yeah, I'm gonna actually pass it back over to Teresa. Thank you so much for your time. I'm excited to speak more about radical inclusion in museums. I head it back over to Teresa. Thank you so much, Andre. Wow, I mean, one thing that I see in that video is how much joy is emanating from all of the different spaces of the museum. Something, hi everyone, I'm not sure if you caught what I just said, but I just said to Andre that I was um, so, so pleased to see how much joy was emanating from the museum. Uh, when you see those videos and you see the, the happiness, the smiles, it's something that we really want to see in museums all the time. So I'd like to invite our next panelist to the virtual stage, Raul Baltazar. A native Angelino, Raul Baltazar is an artist and educator who seeks to decolonize contemporary art production by rooting his artistic practice in the research of ancient cultures. Working in a variety of museums, he creates in his words, space for healing, communication, and reflection. And based on what I know of his teaching practice, I believe this is true of his work with youth as well. Raul's extensive teaching practice includes leading public mural workshops with kids of all ages and mentoring incarcerated youth. 
Last year, he engaged kids in a sculpture project in conjunction with an exhibition organized by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, which was not on display at the museum, but in a satellite gallery at Charles White Elementary School. Raul, what pivotal program or initiative would you like to share with us? Hi. Hi, Teresa. Um, thank you so much for um, my inclusion. Uh, I just want to say uh, that it's a good day to be in Yangna or Tangva land. And I say this because as a premise to my worldview, how I'm approaching my practice in that I'm aware that my parents migrated north from Chihuahua and, and uh, like Mexico City area. And they migrated up to this Tongva land. And um, it was because they were doing what was natural and just being alive. And all of us are here in that way, you know, I'm sure because we've all journeyed to just enrich our lives and, and are willing to move. And, um, and it's a good and a beautiful thing. And it's incredible to me how often it's demonized, right? So that's kind of how I approached my, my practice in that I'm trying to remember all those broken pieces of our culture. And, uh, and you know, as a, as a world culture, we are, we're all connecting, we're all humans, but also specifically like Mesoamerican and Chicano culture, you know, Los Angeles culture is kind of like what I, I really specialize in. Um, but specifically with, within regards to this pivotal moment, you know, and with this exhibition or a pivotal example, and when I think of the word, of course, pivotal, you know, it's something that creates a situation for something bigger and grander. And uh, I think it was it was a great opportunity because uh, Edward, Eduardo Sanchez, who is a curator specifically for um, for the Latin American and the um, ancient. Um, Mesoamerican um, collections. He was working with the education department and they decided to have this exhibition with Rufino Tamayo, uh, who's an amazing Mexican uh, artist. Um, you know, he was uh, living around, you know, from, uh, just to be specific, from 1899 to 1991. And uh, he, he got to live in Europe for a while. He came back, he worked a lot with Mesoamerican uh, myths and, and really connected back with his community from Oaxaca. And so I was really blessed to be able to work with and to be in discourse with this artist's practice. Uh, one of the specific pieces that really drew me to it, uh, I'll show you in this book right here. It's, uh, if you could see that, it's a huge um, print. And I know there's a link for you if you wanna investigate it more. But this is a, this was with Mixografia and this mural print was like five feet by eight feet uh, large. And it was all made out of um, an experimental paper process where they had to actually get a five ton stone from Mexico and to press it. And so when I got this opportunity, which of course I said yes, when Eduardo uh, asked me if I would be interested, um, he said he was looking for uh, someone who, who understood community, culture, landscape, who could create dialogue, connect with ancient Mesoamerican work, AKA the ancestors, um, and how it relates to uh, master artist Rufino Tamayo. And so I was like, okay, that sounds good. Uh, I, I think I could do something with that. <laughs> and so um, the thing was to make the, the sculpture in paper. And um, so we got Mixografia to actually make the paper pulp 
And then we started creating these 10 foot sculptures, which were, you know, dogs chasing people out of basically like the Garden of Eden, which was in a way, unfortunately, what happened was with the COVID-19, um, I think that was a big awakening for us too and how we are treating the earth and how the earth will bite back if we don't, if we're not in harmony with it and take care of it. But I had um, over 80 students that were available. I had workshops in the weekend where I was working with community artists and it was just incredible to build together. And, and it was also very experimental, you know, so um, I just think it was a great example because especially those youth, I think are the most um, cosmopolitan, uh, like genius kids in, of LA that are just exposed to like so many cultures, uh, you know, Korean, El Salvador, you know, black culture, um, you know, Mexican culture, Chicano culture, uh, you know, and so many more. There's like 34 other cultures in, in that area, which is MacArthur Park area, you know. So um, this is an example of, of a mural project I did uh, at Camp Carl Holton uh, with incarcerated youth. And then this is a performance slash protest piece where we blinked out and, and began to uh, bring in Tibetan Buddhist aesthetics as well as, um, you know, just protest aesthetics and using makeup and, and outfits and, you know, and things along that line. Uh, so I think with that, I should pass it back to uh, Teresa. I don't know if I've gone over um, my time, um, but um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raul. And uh, thanks for giving us a few different um, glimpses into the various projects that you've worked on with youth. It's so inspiring to see the ways in which you engage youth with exhibitions um, and help them to create works of art inspired by those exhibitions. So I'd like to bring up our final panelist, Vashtai Dubois. Through nearly three decades of work in nonprofit and arts administration, Vashtai Dubois has dedicated her, dedicated her career to honoring and celebrating the unique experiences of girls and women of color. She has fostered healing through the arts, helped families achieve economic self-sufficiency, and increased access to literacy initiatives at organizations such as the Free Library of Philadelphia, Treehouse Books, and Congresso Girls Center. As the founder and executive director of the Colored Girls Museum in Philadelphia, she, sh she shines a light on the everyday experiences of black girls by creating a space to honor their art and artifacts. When I think about what's possible for museums, how they can truly be central to communities as a sanctuary, a place of healing and resilience, a true home, I think of the Colored Girls Museum. You can learn more about Vashti's, Vashti's accomplishments in the chat. And Vashti, please share your example of a meaningful intersection of museum and community engagement. Well, it's evening here in Philadelphia, so good evening, everybody. Um, it is a pleasure to listen to um, to my colleagues, you know, my you know this crew in education, in museums, and in the arts. Um, I do have thirty years of experience in this work, and so I'm coming to the Colored Girls Museum. And this part of my life is really, really very special to me. And so when considering this question about um, a pivotal moment in the Colored Girls Museum, um, I would have to say that everything we do is a pivotal moment. Um, built into the DNA of the Colored Girls Museum is not a reimagining of the museum as much as imagining what a museum might be for the ordinary, extraordinary colored girl and her people. Like, what would that look like for her? And that is what we've actually set out to do. So before I, I read you this passage, which I find interesting, which was part of the homework of stepping into the museum, and then I'll talk about the images that you're gonna see moving, which is the exhibit I'm going to offer as a specific example. I just want to acknowledge my colleagues, um, Milena Garay, who's actually the director 
of education at the Colored Girls Museum, which is a pretty powerful, we're building out a really powerful story that centers uh, the educational experience of Black women and girls from the position that she now holds. Uh, Michael Clemens, the curator for the Colored Girls Museum, Ian Friday, the performance curator and the associate director, because it's always really important to say, and I think this is important for the field, for the education field, for the museum field, that um, anybody can have a good idea, but you can't get any of this stuff done by yourself. So you are as good as the powerful teams that you build around you. Now, a bit of homework that brought us into the Colored Girls Museum, and this was done five years ago. Um, we use language a great deal and often forget what, um, you know, what a word means because we throw it around so much. And so when the Colored Girls Museum became the name of this institution, one of the first things I did was go back to the dictionary to look up the meaning of the actual word museum as someone had written it down. So what I'm going to read for you now is Britannica's definition of a museum. Um, but you'll note that there's a change here because what I did as homework for myself was I replaced all of the references to museum with the language of the colored girl. And I just want you to notice what happens to the passage when that occurs. The Colored Girls Museum, and again, this is Encyclopedia Britannica's definition of museums. The Colored Girls Museum is dedicated to preserving and interpreting the colored girl as primary tangible evidence of humankind and her environment. In its preserving of her as primary evidence, colored girls differ markedly from other girls to which she has often been compared. For the stories housed in a colored girl are mainly unique and constitute the raw material of study and research. The colored girl, the object in many cases, is removed in time, place, and circumstance from her original context. She communicates directly to the viewer in a way not possible or required of other girls. Colored girls have been used for a variety of purposes to serve as recreational facilities, scholarly venues, or educational resources, to contribute to the quality of life of the environments where they are situated, to attract tourism to a region, to promote civic pride or nationalistic endeavor, or even to transmit overtly ideological concepts. Given such a variety of purposes, colored girls reveal remarkable diversity in form, content, and even function. Yet despite such diversity, they, she, we are bound by a common goal, a desire, the preservation and interpretation of some material, spiritual, emotional evidence of our impact on our society's cultural consciousness. So it's easier to think about what that feels like if you read it. So if you want to read it, I'm happy to share it in the chat. But it's very interesting to me when I did this exercise and inserted color girl and pronouns for, for, for her in all of these different places, how unfortunately well it fit into the description of a museum. The slides that you're looking at are images of our muses and their artists. Um, the project is called First Time Ever I Saw Your Face. And First Time Ever I Saw Your Face is the 11th exhibit for the Colored Girls Museum. It's a portrait project where we commissioned six artists to do portraits of six ordinary colored girls in Philadelphia. And this is a project that's been underway for several years, actually, for the museum. And so this is not the first body of, um, of portraits. But we really have been thinking about how the portrait is this iconic museum genre artifact and how when you go into important institutions, hospitals, schools, places of worship, museums, we're often looking up on the walls at white men. And what would it be 
to create, to, to offer portraits of ordinary colored girls. So that when you come into the Colored Girls Museum or you go any place that these portraits of ordinary colored girls are, you are looking up to her. So the work was, and the work is, to consider the power of the ordinary colored girl. And the work is also the work of the artist, how the idea of creation, how the process of creating the portrait itself is a healing event and how that healing event transforms any space that you would find these portraits in. First time ever I saw your face is the Colored Girls Museum's visual love letter to the ordinary colored girl. Our mission is that we are a public ritual for her protection, praise, and grace. Our belief being that if you send to the ordinary black and brown girl in all that you do, everybody benefits. The whole world shifts to a higher advantage. So when I think about a project that is transformative, when I think about a pivot, I think about the importance of centering citizens who are always at the bottom of all things. And I think about how centering them fundamentally changes everything. So what I offer the education field, the museum field, is this opportunity to think about what it means. Now, this is our 11th exhibit. Everything at the Colored Girls Museum, every exhibit only centers her. And we believe and we have evidence from those who visit us here that this pivot is the kind of pivot that the museum field needs right now. What happens when we are no longer centering whiteness, but when we consider someone who in many cases the world considers the least of these. So I offer to you the Colored Girls Museum as an example. And first time ever I saw your face as a powerful vehicle that will be moving about in the world gathering other ordinary colored girl portraits as she goes because the ordinary colored girl receives her protection praise and grace because she never travels alone so thank you and thank you for the question i'm gonna shift this back to teresa thank you so much Vashtai. what an incredible example of radical inclusion, right? Um, so that brings us actually to our next prompt. And with this, I'd like to invite all of our panelists to join me and you, Vashtai, back on the virtual stage for our second question. And for this question, I hope that uh, any of you can uh, unmute yourselves to answer it. And I've shared this with them in advance, full transparency. Um, <laughs> so this question is about radical, Radical inclusion. As you all know, our program is titled Community Collaboration and Radical Inclusion, and you've all shared powerful examples of collaborating with communities. Um, so let's focus on that last piece. When I hear the words radical and inclusion, um, I think about how they've been thrown out a, a lot lately. We just hear those words um, come up in social media and in the public, especially when people are talking about alternatives to current systems and exclusionary practices. So I consulted a dictionary too, um, to look up radical. Webster's dictionary defines radical as, quote, very different from the usual or traditional, favoring extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, or institutions. In my view, when we join the words radical and inclusion in the context of museums, we are offering an alternative to the colonialist, racist, and exclusionary legacies of museums. An alternative in which many of our diverse communities are engaged and feel a sense of belonging. But what does that really look like, right? So uh, my question for all of, of our panelists, as well as for all of you in the audience is, what does a radically inclusive museum look like by your definition? How would museums need to shift in order to be radically inclusive? Everyone in the audience, please feel free to write your response in the chat. And for our panel, let's start with Vashtai. Can 
And feel free to unmute yourself. So um, there are a couple of interesting things here around this idea, this concept of radical inclusion, which is again, interesting from our perspective as the Colored Girls Museum. First of all, I have you know, colleagues and friends working in all kinds of museum institutions around the world. And um, their presence there in many ways makes it possible for us to work in the way that we work because their expertise, their, um, their stories um, and their offerings make it possible for us to amplify the work that we're doing. When I think about inclusive, there's an assumption that everybody wants to be included. And, um, and, and there's an assumption that inclusivity is the best thing ever. And there's an assumption that inclusivity will move us forward in some, in some way. But I think about the limits inclusivity places on the imagination of folks who are wanting to do truly interesting and different work. If you don't have to concern yourself with whether or not you're included, you're actually freed up to think about what you want to think about. If you don't have to concern yourself with inclusivity, you don't have to do the other fight of making sure people are going to let you in the door when you're doing incredible, dynamic, life-changing, earth-shaking work, because your energy and your attention should be able to be on that thing and not on the fight to get in. So I also here want to offer that there, you know, we need multiple ways of moving this thing, but we also need to be able to, and be willing to be honest about our own DNA, right? It's really hard to, to create uh, inclusive practices when in your DNA is exclusion. How are you gonna do that? How are you gonna get there? I have some thoughts about how you could do it. You know, when I think about some of the museums, you know, that I visited as a kid, like the only black folks I saw were the security staff. So like, what would happen if museums were not going after the sexy, right? But they were like not outsourcing security. They were actually hiring security, bringing them into the institution, paying them a livable wage, giving them passes to the museum so they could bring their family and friends and acknowledging them for the experts they are because security knows more about the art than anybody because they're the ones who are listening to the curatorial team they're the ones listening to the docents they have the information they are experts so if we want to be inclusive let's start with the people who are already in our house let's look at the staff that we have in our house let's elevate that staff that's in the house let's ask the folks who we say we want to include if they actually want to be included or if they'd rather have the resources to build their own stuff because one of the other challenges around inclusivity is that it's like gentrification, right? You always got to go to the other part of town to get, you know, to get good sprout bread, right? And then you got to spend your gas, your time to go over there to get that thing, to bring it back to your neighborhood. And by the time you get it back to your neighborhood, you might not even want that bread anymore. So how about while we're doing all of this really important work around trying to make museum spaces more hospitable, how about we also um, ask some of the community members who want to do their own thing, how about we put some resources over there too? Let's not make an extra wing for the colored girl, you know, in the museum on the side. Let's ask the colored girls museum um, if they want to partner with us so y'all can come see what we're up to and so that we have those resources and we're able to build our own institutions, if that's what we want to do. So when I think about radical inclusivity, I think about recognizing how complex we all are in this field, that we all want different stuff and making it possible for us to actually have it. And finally, I'm going to say, the reason to be inclusive is not because you're doing us a favor. Those of us who are outside, if you want to be inclusive, it's because folks should want to do it because it's better for the institution. 
when you have smarter people, different people, people who are coming with a different skill set and worldview, every single human being benefits. So inclusivity is not for us, it's for everybody. Thank you, Vashti. Lots of head nods with the panelists, lots of yeses in the chat. Um, so thank you for, for sharing your thoughts on that. And it does make me think of some of the conversations I've had with Raul recently about some other examples of inclusivity in not necessarily museums, but in art spaces. So Raul, could you share your thoughts on what radical inclusion might look like? Well, um, yeah. You well, thank you, Vasta. You really made me reflect, and um, I know that uh, I've I've been making work, you know, since I was a kid, and um, I, I've I've always joined different institutions because I wanted to see someone like me included, and and somehow or another, I found that I needed to put my voice in there. Uh, whether I was in the Navy, when I painted a mural inside of a naval ship and put Ch Chicano images in there hidden, um, or doing these murals inside juvenile halls and having the kids put up, you know, their um, quiche like uh, language inside, you know, these rooms, um, or going into art school after, you know, like in my 30s to finally get a bachelor's degree in art and fine art and, and an MFA in art in order to be at the table and to no longer be an outsider in this game because I just felt like I was always edged out even though I felt very strong in the work that I was doing in the community. And so, <laughs> so with that, you know, I'm still a teaching artist. I'm still trying to get in there to make the top quality work as possible, but you face a lot of internalized racism within our own community often. You feel it within the institution, you feel it with the students, you know, where they're trying to come up, but, but they're, you know, it's all like, we're, we're, you know, it's you know, like what Bell Hooks talks about, you know, white patriarchal cap, you know, uh, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy you know, embedded inside. And so, as an artist, it's like, how do you suck that out? Or how do you at least get to voice that? And then often you have museum, you know, like the institutions try to sanitize that because they don't really want to see it because it's not proper, but they have to have that cathartic moment to see what the truth is, you know? So within working with the museum, that's been good in the way that they have that access and the way I see like this kind of like school to pipeline industry with the prisons, there should be, I think a school to museum pipeline, you know, or these other higher learning institutions because so many contemporary artists are actually gleaning off of that culture and they're pulling from their aesthetics and then rebranding them or commodifying them to fulfill these, you know, academic or the cultural industry, right? Or the, the art market. And so I'm, I'm very aware of this kind of low intensity cultural war that's happening. Yet at the same time, like culture is what brings us together and can be the most healing, you know, asset that we have that creates empathy for each other. So I just think like, I would love to see museums maybe especially in LA County, taking over a lot of these closed juvenile halls. I would love for them to be able to provide maybe uh, more support for nonprofits who are already doing this work. I would love for them to be able to take care of their staff so we could have things like insurance and benefits and retirement, you know, or figure out plans to help us because artists are like, man, it, we're so disenfranchised and trying to do so much and the violence, whether it's sanctioned or unsanctioned forms of violence that most of these kids are, have to deal with. Um, and, and the fact that we, we also are dealing with that type of, you know, um, sanctioned and unsanctioned forms of violence, whether it's poverty, racism, you know, or, or uh, even um, not having your culture valued and, and uh, you know, so those are things that we need to 
prepare these students in order to fight, you know, um, and to take the struggle further. But um, within the last almost 25 years that I've been around doing it, it's taken people to get into those positions of authority within the institution to open up more roads for us to do better, you know, to gain more access for our communities. Thank you, Raul. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andre, um, I want to turn it over to you. The program that you shared with us did seem to be a good example of really shifting the uh, platform, the, the ability to create a salon within a museum is a really interesting model. Um, could you answer the question as well? What does a radically inclusive museum look like to you? Yeah, can I just say that if I was wearing a wig, my wig probably would have fell off and I would have had to readjust it after hearing what Vashti just said, literally, literally. <laughs> Thank you so much for your perspective, sis. Um, you know, I'm gonna keep it super fundamental and super basic. I, I really, when I think of radical inclusion, um, and Teresa, thank you so much for giving that definition. Um, you know, there's another definition that talks about the complete and thorough um, uh, change, political or social change, right? And so when I think of complete and thorough change or extreme change, I think of a complete uprooting of a system, right? And then a transforming of, of that um, not even transforming of that system, but a, a complete change, right? Uprooting what we have been doing um, and implementing something new. Um, you know, I, I really feel like we need to be seeing ourselves as the, the space where, our, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to keep it from the perspective of young people, where young people are able to come and access the education resources, the training that they deserve, um, the learning opportunities that they deserve, those things that they are not receiving in their schools, the things that they are not receiving access to um, in their homes, the technology that they're not receiving access to in their schools and at their homes. We need to see ourselves as that bridge and as that intermediary. Um, but also just kind of breaking it down to super fundamental, y'all. <laughs> if you look up teens and museums in Google, for the most part, you're probably going to find a lot of um, a, a lot of links and articles about like, how do we get teens and youth into our museums? How do we get them to be involved and get them to be interested? That is indicative of, of the fact that they probably don't want to be there. Like, I think it is okay for us to have a, this difficult conversation and even to say something difficult youth don't always want to be at a museum. And I actually love what Vashti said about like talking about inclusion, right? And I hadn't even thought about it, right? You're, we're talking about being inclusive and wanting all to be, um, to, to be, to feel welcomed and um, to be included at our museums, but what if some don't? And I will say this, young people do not always feel that they are accepted and that they belong in a museum space. Um, I love how Raul talked about wanting to, um, to number one, feel accepted and to allow others who look like him feel like that they belong in a, in a museum space. Um, I've oftentimes seen young people come into any museum space and those who, you know, may have a, a more uh, non-traditional aesthetic in a sense that they're not coming and they're the most manicured student coming from um, you know, a, a, a middle school or a high or a high school in this super economically developed um, area. And so they come in, and when they come in, you know, people are kind of looking at them like, "What you doing here? <laughs> what, why are you Why are you walking up in here?" I've I've literally seen people look at young look at youth that come into the space as if they're not supposed to be there. And so I think when we talk about like wanting our young people to feel accepted and included in our, in our museums, do we really want them there? Like, let's ask ourselves that. Do we really want black and brown youth in our museums? Do we really want black and brown youth from the hood walking up in our museums? Cause I've definitely seen otherwise, you know? And so I think that we need to recognize that it's going to just simply take for us to allow our young people to feel like they are accepted, um, to, and well, really to, for us to accept them um, and to establish a sense of belonging. That's what it starts out with, just establishing community, you know? And I've done, 
when I was at the Hirshhorn Museum, I was very, very sensitive to that, you know, understanding that I don't typically see myself um, in contemporary art museums, you know, so what does it mean to ensure that I have my young people represented in that space? Um, and so it literally took for me to make our youth the originators, like, I know that you don't see yourself there, but we're going to be the ones that are going to serve as that representation for others to be involved. And also, I'll just say this one last thing. If we are doing our work to impact um, the young people who are sitting furthest on the, on the margins, everybody is going to win. You know, I realized that the work that I was doing, um, you know, while I'm sitting here and trying to impact or to expand gender in the space, right? What ended up happening is I started to be get, I started to get um, young people who um, were trans, um, young people who were GNC youth, people, young people who um, um, held uh, disabilities or walked in with disabilities. And so it forced me to then have to say, okay, you know, what kind of um, protocol, what type of training sessions can I put in place to ensure that this new set of youth that's coming in is being impacted? But when I was doing the work to impact a certain segment that is disenfranchised, the others began to come to the table. And so it's a matter of us doing the work and knowing, yo, sometimes we're going to get it wrong. Sometimes we are going to mess up, but we have to be willing to take those risks and being willing to bring the people to the table who, like Raul said, I think um, Vashti said this too, who are already doing the work, bringing in those um, individuals who have that level of expertise to support us and ensuring that we are impacting and fully um, accommodating those who um, are new to our museum. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I want to turn over to Adjoa. You've been bringing people to the table for a long time in your work. So let's hear from you. How would you answer the question about radical inclusion in museums? What does that look like? Yeah, I'll share some examples from um, our perspective. I just wanna say, I so appreciate um, these different kind of locations of, of my fellow panelists. I think that um, there's such a rich conversation here because we're all entering from, um, from kind of different um, locations. So, and I do think that the question of radical inclusivity looks different depending on where, where, you're, where you're speaking from, right? Um, in terms of the Brooklyn Museum, I'll say that I think the, the places that I see what I would consider the most um, radical versions of radical inclusivity it are um, in a, a couple places. One is our phenomenal teen programs department um, under the leadership of Lindsay C. Harris, but building also off of the legacy of other you know, folks before her who have had and sustained a, vi a vision of radical inclusion of teen voices within the museum at large. So what that looks like is we have you know, 45 paid intern positions at the museum and teens are trained as museum educators, leading um, uh, guided lessons for younger audiences, for other teens, and also for adults as part of our, you know, at, uh, our public programs series. Um, and then they're also trained as public programmers, and they actually develop public programming for other teens. And what's been critical to, to our vision um, in developing these programs is the idea of centering their agency. So it's not about uh, you know, it being cute and it looks so cute to have teens running around doing this work, but it's really opening up space and protecting the program so that this, there is space given for them to really develop the thing that they wanna develop. Talking about the themes they wanna talk about, contracting the folks they wanna uh, contract, um, and so we have uh, four core programs that are paid internships that encompass these um, 45 positions. And that's the Museum Apprentices Program, which is the oldest one, and that trains museum, uh, teens as museum educators. Um, Teen Night Planning Committee, which uh, develops our, our public program centered on teen nights, and our intersections programs which is specific to teen that uh, identify as LGBTQ+, and they develop public programs in particular 
for teen, for other teens identifying um, as queer. And so, you know, I think that, so that's, I think one has been a really powerful example. And to um, Vashti's point, this is a benefit primarily to the institution because these are the voices that are really helping us to, re to or first of all, pointing out the cracks, pointing out the, 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 the problems ongoing always, and those are the ones that are really able to activate a radical imagination for what the future might be for an institution that has encyclopedic pretensions, that has collections from all over the globe, in, in also a feminist art collection, et cetera. Um, we also have um, our museum education fellowship program. And I see actually folks uh, in the chat, alums from that, it's a 35 year old, um, kind of pipeline pathway program, bringing in incredible BIPOC uh, 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 leadership to the field across the country. Um, we have uh, a core group of, of, of people built coming up in leadership within the museum that are all graduates of that program and includes an intensive training that includes um, an understanding of critical race theory, popular education, um, uh, uh, queer theory, in addition to developmental theories, you know, and, and uh, overview of, collection, of collections, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that building those kind of structural pathways is critical, but I wanna say that, you know, uh, this is something that I feel like comes up a lot and is something internally that at the Brooklyn Museum, we continue to struggle with, which is, just because you're making things in inclusive, that doesn't mean things get easier. In fact, if you're doing it right, things will get harder before they get easier. And oftentimes I run into people kind of very, you know, kind of progressive or, or like, but wait a minute, we opened the doors. Why are people complaining? That's why they're complaining. Because if you open the doors and you're asking people to come to the table who have not been on the table, they're gonna point out stuff that you don't wanna hear. And that is part of the work. Like, so I think that, that you know, there's, there is a lot of kind of um, this romantic illusion that, you know, people should be grateful to you because you, you are now all of a sudden you decided you're interested in being inclusive. That's only the beginning. And that beginning is actually setting you up for a whole bunch of challenges and a lot of really difficult work. It would have been much easier if you just kept the door shut. But if you're saying you want it open, get ready, because really you're gonna be challenged. You think you're being challenged now? You haven't seen the half of it. And that's, and that's the work of radical inclusion. Yes, Adjua, yes, to all of you. Um, I just wanna reiterate some of your points. It feels like there's a lot of threads with various um, ideas that you've put forward. And a lot of it has to do with centering agency um, it's questioning the, the uh, sort of impulse behind or the intention behind wanting to be inclusive and making sure that we really want that and being prepared for what happens when we do open those doors. Um, it's been a really great honor to hear all of your responses to that question. I wanna lift up a couple of responses from our audience who also shared some incredible examples of what, of what radical inclusion means to them. Bianca, hi Bianca, shared, radical to me is shifting power, relinquishing power from inside the museum to the community and relinquishing the idea that the knowledge the museum and its educators have is powerful and honoring the knowledge and experience of the people without power or capital. Vicky shared, move the museum to the community, take it outside where people do their day to day. Museums can be intimidating, we need to go outside and then bring them in. So there's a, a lot of great, I encourage everyone to look at the chats um, when we can, and, and hopefully we can share out a few more on social media in the upcoming days, because it's a really incredible conversation that's happening. So um, at this point, I do wanna open it up further to Q&A and bring in my colleagues, Hallie Scott, specialist for university audiences, and Tara Burns, specialist for family and K-12, K-12 audiences, who will kick off our Q&A. Thank you, Teresa. 
And I know our panelists can't, might not be seeing the chat, but the enthusiastic yeses and applauses that come in as you all are speaking, let me know that there are some educators here who have, ooh, we are trying to do some work. We've been, been through some things. So I actually would like to talk to us, I'd like to talk to everyone now about the how, the how we do this radical reimagining of what the museum might look like. And what I heard as you all were speaking, we didn't say it explicitly, but I was hearing a lot of educator skills in some of the work that you were talking about. So the instinct to ask people, is this helpful? Is this useful for you before I offer it to you? It's definitely an educator instinct. This skill of meeting people where they are in the work that we're doing is something that we all practice. And so I'm curious to hear from each of you, um, just one skill that you think that educators cultivate and practice that museums should elevate if we are going to be able to do the work of radical reimagining. I'll put it to you and I'm also going to ask it in the chat too, so that we can hear from our audience and hear what they think. I'll jump in there with, with a thought, which is, um, you know, one of, I, I come from a, a bi-national background. I'm, I'm both African-American with roots down South and family that migrated to New York and, and Brazilian. And one of my big um, uh, kind of, uh, one of my big inspirations from, from my Brazilian side of things is a educator, adult educator, Paulo Freire. Um, and um, one of the skills that, that, uh, that he articulates in some of his writings uh, as part of like a popular education framework is this idea of uh, trust in the process, which requires a, also a silencing of, of ego, but also because he was coming from that whole like liberation theology type of thing, also the, the faith the faith that um, that real critical transformative dialogue that is centering on 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 truth and on and the roots of the situation going back to this idea of radical right like based on the the historic roots of the reality of a situation um, that if you excavate that and you present people with that with the full truth of their condition and their reality that that will always lead to transformation, which then also pushes us as educators. I think educators have this, ab this ability of like, don't come at it thinking you need to tell people what they need to think and what the answer is. And you're gonna let go of the, of the savior complex and trust in the process and that that process is gonna help you to figure out what needs to manifest uh, as a facilitator you know, of, of, a, of, a, of an experience that something is gonna come out of it. You may not know, and you shouldn't try, think you know, you know, um, so it's a tricky thing because you're also not, not um, you're not um, totally, uh, I don't know, quote unquote objective or like you are a facilitator, right? So that balance between actually leading something, but at the same time, opening up space for something to come up and take hold that you didn't plan or intend. That skill, I think, is a really critical skill. I'm seeing someone, Ellen, in the chat saying, ask more questions than give answers, kind of echoing that sentiment. Yes, Raul, what were you going to share? Well, I was just thinking like when I teach my art classes, I really like to, um, you know, like give kids, for example, power tools, you know, and, um, you know, to begin a drill and, and really hands on kinds of things. Um, it, it freaks a lot of the, the institutions out or people, you know, because of insurance things and all that. But I, I find that if you really are there and you and you give these kids the opportunity because lots of times they don't have parents to teach them how to use those tools or things or or, or you know and so like you 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 gain a lot of trust but not only that that's more like the but i really try to also get them into the conceptualization design and production so it's, it's so much of it is like 
first of all, how do they, how do you get them to see and think and then how to most effectively communicate their idea or their voice, you know? So that's kind of like, you know, when, when we first start looking at art, it's always like, what do you see? Like just very simple, you know? And then all of a sudden, instead of telling them what they see, you know, or pointing out what they're supposed to see. And, you know, so that's kind of my approach. So I'll jump in. Um, educators are lit. We're just, we're just, we're, we are lit. <laughs> and we know how to establish relationships, real authentic relationships um, with, with visitors. Um, they're real <laughs> and most of the time when folk need for us to bring in young people or even, you know, whether it's families, youth and families, they're coming to us <laughs> to ask us to bring those folks to the table because they don't have the real deep seated relationships like we do with the visitors. Um, I would say that we're fearless. We're fearless. And when we're put in positions where our ideas are being elevated and fully um, advocated for, we literally can accomplish anything. Um, being able to be in a space where we know that we come up with these crazy ass ideas, right? And know that those who oversee us or that our, super, our supervisors um, are advocating for us and are like, let's make this magic happen. Um, it, it helps us to rest in, in fearlessness. We become fearful when we are concerned with messing up. Right, but the thing about us as educators is we understand what exploration looks like. We understand, you know, that when you try, you, sometimes you fail, right? But those are that's where the learning happens. And so, if we're given the opportunity to be able to put our crazy and outrageous I ideas forward, and for them to be advocated for and to be fully supported, we literally can accomplish anything. Um, creative, you know, we're, we are extremely creative um, and are always producing um, or advocating for innovative um, thinking. Um, and so those are things that I think about when I think about educators and, and what are the skill sets that we bring to a space that are, that are so unique. Um, I think about the support that I've had at the Hirsch, or that I had at the Hirschhorn Museum when I was there um, with my outrageous ideas. What, I don't know what other space I would have been able to be in that would have allowed me to transform their space into a black hair salon, right? I've heard so many different stories from educators um, and not, not in all museums, but in some who don't have that same support, um, you know, who present ideas, but don't have the opportunity to execute them because um, senior staff are afraid that it's going to mess up or look bad or just not be well manicured, right? But that's really where the learning takes place. Um, and so I would say if there if there is an a if there is an opportunity for um, <laughs> the higher beings <laughs> to offer us the space to authentically support and to be down with our ideas and allow us to execute them and know that there might be some things that are a little, you know, they screw up a bit, but also know that we're willing to take, you know, do what it takes to make it successful. Um, yeah, I think that that'll, that'll definitely help to transform museum spaces. Um, yes to all of that. And then, um, and then this, which is, you know, the, the central question that guides, um, you know, my thinking and I think our collective work, whether we're working with, um, you know, our young folks or whether we're working with uh, our artists and curators is the question of what is it that you want to know? Like, what do you want to know from wherever you are uh, in the world, from whatever your position is and the ability, like what a powerful question that that is, because not everybody has an opportunity to take a spin at that question because the world is not created equally in that way. Um, you know, so much of what uh, powerful educators do well, and you know, like moms are some of the most powerful educators I know, is, um, you know, they hold open uh, the space for you to find the language for things there are no words for, you know, depending on who you are coming into these conversations, the words that we have do not always or often serve the outcomes that we're after. The words are a trap. So 
you know, and that's tricky if you consider yourself an educator, because that's that's one of your principal tools. Uh, the beautiful thing about being an artist is that you can put those words down um, when they're getting in the way and you can engage with some other things that get you to another layer of understanding, another point of entry. And so, you know, the I, I think broadly when I think about educators, um, because some of the dopest people I know, because education, the way many of us understand it never worked for them, they're able to engage and, um, and transform in ways that uh, so many people who have the experience as educators are constantly jacking up the thing um, because they all they want to do is create the possibility of something being able to occur that wasn't in the space before. It's so beautiful, the opening up space for opportunity makers. That really, that resonates um, now. I'm going to turn it over to Hallie for, for another question about reimagining. Thanks, Tara. And thank you so much, everyone, um, panelists, and in the chat. It's so affirming to hear all of these skills that, that we have and that we try to cultivate as educators. Uh, I'm going to pose one more question, and then we will start to pull questions directly from the Q&A. So I see that there are some that have been added. Audience, if you have other questions, please add them to the Q&A. And our time is a little bit limited. We'll, we'll try to get to some of them. Um, so. Uh, I think it was really exciting on Ray that you were able to get support for senior staff for your ideas. I know that's something that some of us um, struggle with sometimes. Um, and I think our skills as educators are too often undervalued and underfunded within cultural institutions. And I think this has been especially kind of devastating in this year where we have seen so many layoffs and furloughs and cuts for educators and, and educational programs in many museums and other arts organizations. So I'm curious to hear from you all about strategies that you have for advocating for the value of educational work and for raising funds for it. And anybody can jump in. So can I jump in real quick? This is literally like my favorite conversation. It is my favorite conversation. Look, we have the power to, to really determine what our experience as educators look like. We have that power. Um, and I say that because while I was at the Hirshhorn, I had to spend a lot of time fundraising on my own behalf. Um, whether that was internal grant opportunities or external grant opportunities, I took on that responsibility to do it because I wanted to make my ideas happen. And I knew that I could not depend on anybody else. My ideas, and I'm sure several people out there who are listening, you know, the panelists, our ideas are magic. And if we want to make them happen, we have to be able to take control and to be independent. We can't wait on the advancement office to come to us with something. We can't wait for our supervisor to come, um, come to us with a funding opportunity. We have to be resourceful and look for those opportunities on our own because ain't nobody about to tell you if you got a $60,000 grant, that you that you applied for, you know, you went through the process, you got it, and you you know you're I don't know, you want to transfer the mu museum into a NASCAR stadium. I don't know, I'm just making this up. Your your uh the the curators, the senior staff are not going to say no if you got a sixty thousand dollar grant to back up your work. You know what I'm saying? You literally can make anything happen, but money is it. I remember receiving this, or money is golden. I remember receiving this um this piece of advice from. Um, a deputy, deputy director um, who's now my mentor. And she, I remember her saying to me, like before she transitioned out, she was like, yo, if you can bring money into the museum, she didn't say yo, but if you can bring money into the museum, you are golden, literally. And I took that and I'm like, okay. So I began to fundraise and anything that I wanted to make happen began to happen because I had that backing. You know what I'm saying? And I don't know if that's everyone's like, if that is a luxury of everyone, but I do think that we do have the ability um, to be resourceful, to look up opportunities, you know, ask your advancement office what's out there. They're not always going to be, you know, able to support you and dedicate their time solely to you. 
you know, set up a meeting with them. What can I do to, to support us in figuring out what funding opportunities are out there and apply, create your idea, apply for that job and you probably are going to get it. You know what I'm saying? Don't wait, do not wait, do not wait. Cause ain't nobody, ain't nobody waiting for you. <laughs> Go ahead and make it happen. Yeah, I want to co-sign um, everything that um, Andre just said. I think that, you know, right now museums are at a crossroads, right? And there's a legitimacy crisis. There's a crisis on about whether museums are relevant, right? And, I, and education is right at the middle, um, is essential to that, to that conversation. A lot, a lot of museums, um, their mission, there's the earned revenue piece. And, and now I'm talking as like someone who is also in, in, in the kind of institutional conversations around the budget, the deficit, you know, the long-term plan where education sits within the, the educate within the institution and all of those conversations. And what I see is that there's always this kind of tension or, or attempt to strike a balance between your earned revenue uh programming and exhibits um speaking from from the perspective of, of an institution like similar to the brooklyn museum right and your mission-based work and your mission-based work is a is is the area of the work that's funded through institutional giving or maybe it's called contributed income i.e grants right um and and usually the folks leading all of uh, all of the initiatives on the mission based front is education folks right so what's important is that there's a real recognition that that is bringing in real money it may not be earned revenue but it's but it's grant based work that in some cases can be as relevant if not more relevant than 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 the earned revenue piece so it's really key that um education folks um, you know, are brought into those budget conversations, um, not just on the expense side, but on the revenue side, and that there's a real understanding of how much of the income side is being raised through earned revenue versus through institutional giving and other development efforts, because develop education is key, especially in this moment around all the the support that an institution can muster and that's going to have to be centered on its mission-based work so it's about positioning recognizing and positioning ourselves as educators as critical to not just you know because of the importance of the work but also financially so that is i'm, I'm gonna give you all an amen and I'm also say this, right? The education department, wherever you are, and I've been in social justice, social work for a long time, is the workhorse of every organization. When, you know, when that earned income revenue starts falling off, an institution starts looking at its education department, cause you can almost always get some change cause you gotta educate some people who you didn't have a relationship with before. So that is the low hanging fruit for all of these powerful institutions. The problem I have with it um, is that it does not advance the work of the folks who are out there hustling. So my sisters and brothers who are at these institutions in many ways, and pardon my use of this term, but ghettoized in the education department, do not get the benefit of the salaries and the additional resources that come with all the work that you do to make your to make your institution shine. And you know, we're not in the curatorial to, um, department. We're not in collections. We're not in archives. Like we're in this. And we've all, everybody said it at the beginning, the first thing that you cut when, when there's a crisis, which is dumb, is the education department. That's the first, you know, oh, we don't need to do the education. But as soon as you want to do radical inclusion, you're like, oh, let's get the kids from around the corner in here and get a grant 
from this person, this person, this person, this person. Oh, and by the way, the folks who are the dope educators, the folks are coming to you going, could you write this grant? Could you tell me about your numbers? Could you do this? Could you do that? But are you duly compensated? So what I always say to people, whether they're at the Colored Girls Museum or someplace else, is, pay, you know, if you have that job and you're doing that work, let other people pay you to learn what you need to do and have a vision of how you're going to take your educational, your grant making power and do something for yourself. Because I think it is patently unfair as somebody who's held all those positions and they do not, what they do prepare you for is learn how to write a damn grant and get a fellowship for yourself. But in terms of your ability to move an institution, the education departments never do it no matter how dope they are. They're like, oh yeah, we got the dopest of the dope, but it doesn't, do, it's like, it is not the priority of these institutions. So again, I, you know, I salute, I am so inspired by the work y'all are doing. And I, and I am in deep prayer that as you do this work, you are also figuring out how to build your own stuff because these institutions don't hold on to us and do not love us. Can, can I just really quickly, I am so sorry, I just need to say this because this is so excellent. I don't know if this was y'all experience and for my educators that are listening, when the pandemic, like when we all shut down last March, you know, I think, right, at least for me, my experience has always been, oh my God, I always feel like the education department is always looked at as like a, a last priority. Let me do my work to make sure that I am prioritizing what we need and making sure I'm doing what, what I need to do to get us our resources, right? When the pandemic happened and we started shutting down, and ain't no need for no curators, ain't no need for no conservation department, you know what I'm saying? Ain't no need for like, you know, I mean, obviously there's a need for advancement, but all these departments that were the, the front facing, you know, seen as the kind of like most uh, priority driven, um, you know, departments, we as educators and public programmers became the face. We were the one, everyone else is sitting around there looking at us, the audio department, everybody looking at us like, Oh, what y'all about to do? Because we're the one driving the face and the brand of the museum. Ain't nobody worrying about coming into the museum to experience no art. They're worrying about what we can do to, um, to engage people online through public programming. So now we became the essential people. We became the ones that were of major priority because they needed us to be able to facilitate relationships with schools, you know, to facil facilitate online relationships with the audience. You know what I'm saying? Not the curators, you know what I mean? No shade, but we became the essential employees you know what i'm saying we became the essential workers at museums which was so interesting i don't know if that was anyone else's experience but that definitely of course it is who's in the education department who are the essential workers across the board who keeps it moving when nothing else is moving education is the workhorse of all of these institutions just don't get the love like you're the workhorse of the institution i feel affirmed I think we've all been kind of vigorously nodding our heads at all of this. It's it's happening in the chat as well. Um, Roel, did you want to jump in too? Sure. Uh, I I just want to mention, like, I mean, also the thing is that I've noticed in the work that we do, um, it would be great for the institutions to value it more and to uh, whether in, in what context they put it in. Um, I've done these incredible murals and or paintings with students, well, mural public art murals at schools where I can't get the institutions to provide something like a placard or to photograph it correctly um, or to have someone write about it, you know, and document it as a work of art, you know, through the institution. So that's one thing that I find also is that the institution what I find often with with um, with um, the approach that some people take is that it becomes more about uh, entertainment, you know, or something for for um, you know people to have that museum experience, and so the workshops are cut very short, and it's more almost like if you're doing some type of um, you know just taking care of, of 
kids, you know, in the smaller workshops, um, it's it's very important to really have them go deep and to for them to budget that. But also, I think that the post production part is something that museums should think about and actually either acquiring some of these pieces with with um, you know or, or the context in how they're going to show them. And the same goes with like Alley County Arts Commission and all that. And uh, one other thing that I've noticed is that you're getting a lot of other nonprofits kind of going in the midst of stuff where you have now like, you're trying to work with these kids, let's say, and then you have now like another branch of people who are coming in to observe you and they kill the vibe that you're trying to establish, especially when I work with incarcerated youth. And so that's, that's just always an interesting thing too. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it going. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think um, the, the sharing of artwork after it's created in, in our programs and, and the idea of museums collecting it is a really exciting one. And then also, I think a lot of us have, have had that experience of having donors come in and really shift the dynamics of, of programs. Um, I know Tara has a question from the, from the Q&A that she's gonna pose to everybody. Yeah, I'm so I'm so sorry that we're we're running out of time, so we're only going to have a chance to to address one question. But I think that it's one that would really just round this count conversation out really well. And it actually I've just changed my mind, and it came in through the chat from Carly, who would like to hear about how we share this work that is so important across the institution. So how do we bring in other departments to help us? share the load of having to to do the outreach to make folks feel comfortable to engage them in this space can um each of us speak to an example of reaching across the aisle as it were with other departments to um help serve our audiences this is a little what was that I just said lots of smirks. Oh, okay. <laughs> people were reading this, is a, this is a little, it's not unrelated, but um, I was in another conversation and, um, you know, and it was, again, it was like, you know, radical inclusion. Um, and, and, and so the, there's this whole thing about folks going, well, okay, so if it's the curators, like, you know, when we get ready to build a show, like it takes three years and the curatorial staff, you have to do all these research and, you know, how are we going to pivot? Like, how are we going to be nimble? Because it takes us X amount of time, right, to do whatever it is that we do or collections or archives or, or development, like all these. So like, wouldn't it be really funky then if, if you're bringing in a hair salon if every part of that organization is like, it is the programming that's on your calendar for the year. So you're bringing in your curatorial staff, you're bringing in your collections folks, you're bringing in your archives, you're bringing in everybody who's in the organization. So it's not, it's not this thing that's happening over there. The power of it, and we got to do this with like theater a couple of summers ago, is that also everybody learns everything because bringing in the work is not just about our folks making the artwork or learning the thing. It's like, how do you market that joint? How do you raise money for that joint? How do you archive your thing after the fact? Why can't the entire institution bring, because listen, when young folks make dope artwork, people, institutions have it all over their Facebook page, all over their web page. So bring everybody in. Also, like that's your education. You want to know how it gets done. You actually want to create, um, you know, you you want to really open up a path for some of the young folks you say you want to serve to be able to come into this industry, then let them learn. Cause don't everybody, I, I, you know, I'm ter I'm a terrible visual artist, but I, you know, I was good at development. I was good at like administration. So let me learn that thing. So that's how I think we need to get it done. If, if people are serious, don't just leave it over here on the side, bring it all the way in and see what happens. Like teach everybody everything. Absolutely, I love that. Um, and I, I was gonna say, you know, for 
for the Brooklyn Museum, one of the things that started to happen I, I, um, is back in 2016, 17, um, we, I had an opportunity to participate in a year long arts laboratory put, um, uh, developed by uh, folks from Race Forward. I don't know if anybody's familiar with uh, their work, but uh, they brought together about like 60, um, uh, cultural workers, folks in museum, cultural institutions, and had this year long int intensive arts lab. And out of that year, at the end of that year, you had to develop a prototype to bring back to your institution. So our prototype was to develop, um, uh, you know, and this is, it's always like, oftentimes, I shouldn't say always, oftentimes it's education folks initiating these movements, right? And so out of that, um, the prototype that I developed and support with other folks from education was um, a museum-wide series um, where we were trying to develop some kind of common understandings or the beginnings of a conversation about around uh, shared understandings and vocabularies around um, racial equity, um, that, which then led after a couple years down the line, that led to the beginning of a, a, a racial equity committee, which then became a, a diversity, equity and inclusion staff led with 16 departments represented um, and about um, still active to this day about 35 people involved from across 16 departments. And I think that was a, a, critical, a critical piece in terms of shifting the burden of labor from staff of color, mainly in education, to, to that being starting to be understood and talked about and shared both not just in education, but in curatorial, in collections, in um, development, um, uh, et cetera. There's still gaps, like one of the critiques and something that we still need to address is that while, there while there's union representation in terms of um, um, operation folks and, and, um, and security staff that have much more restricted um, hours, their uh, uh, ability to participate as actively in that space has not been equal or the same to others. So there's definitely ongoing, like deep self-reflection needed. But I say that because that starts to really impact then from there everything. Like then you start to have critical conversations about like, okay, how do these values and understandings show up in how we develop um, and pitch exhibitions, you know? And how does that show up in, 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 in our marketing strategy? And like who, what exhibitions get the kind of royal treatment and the ones that, that don't? How does that show up in our finances? Like in how budgets are actually pitched and, and, and developed, you know? So I think that um, it's, it's this question of like grit to just not just initiate these conversations, but then how do you sustain it? And how do you strike a balance between it not being always to everyone else's point, always the, uh, the folks of color within the institution having to bear the brunt of keeping these conversations active, you know, but at the same time, you don't want it totally taken over by others where you where, where certain kind of perspectives are not represented in those conversations. So like how to strike that balance. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of freaking work. <laughs> yeah, you look, you better take your behind down those stairs and start making relate start building relationships with the building maintenance staff. Take your behind to the security office and start building relationships with the security staff. Take your little behind upstairs to the advancement office and start talking with them, developing relationships, communications, start talking with them. Harass, well, don't harass, but walk into their office, you know what I'm saying? Make inquiries, be in their face all the time. Uh, begin to, you know, if you're a, a leader in education, you're able to be, if you're in a supervisory role, go to those curatorial meetings, 
Make them see your face in every single meeting, exhibition meetings. Go and talk to them, um, cons uh, the conservation office, the design office, who, who you are going to have to seek their support on with printing out um, graphics and creating graphics. This is so simple. And I mean, maybe it's not across the board, but this is my perspective. When they like you, they will support you. When you treat them well and you show that, that you value them, they are going to support, oh, oh, that's Agile's program. Okay, let me make sure we work that out. I'll put the other people's on the side, but they, I, that's Agile always come and say something to me. She's always speaking to me. Do you know how many security people I've run into this? Like, I mean, dang, this public programmer don't even talk to me. This, you know, director, whoever, don't even speak to me. Yo, if you are building those relationships and just showing people that they are of value, they are going to have your back. They will have your back, but you gotta show up. You gotta be bold. You gotta be up in the meetings. You gotta be, um, you know, chatting with them. You know what I'm saying? Any opportunity that you have to be in their face, they're gonna, it's, you're always gonna be at the forefront. Oh my God, Andre and this dag on such and such program. Let me make sure I get her, her stuff out because she's gonna come to my office probably in an hour. Yep, there, here she go, here she go. She coming, asking about these graphics. Be in their face, develop relationships. Andre. That is a great way to end this conversation. Uh, it is 6.47 Pacific Standard Time, which means it is late over there on the East Coast. Um, so I just wanna appreciate uh, and express how much I've loved this conversation, uh, how much I've loved hearing from all of you, your knowledge, your expertise, the ways that you affirm the work that we do. It has been an incredible, incredible evening. And um, I do wanna sort of end with a thought of radical inclusion as we've been discussing it today earlier on for the most part has been about inclusion of communities. But I love how we're ending on how we think about inclusion within our museums. And we think about the ways in which um, we are radically including everybody internally. Um, that is a community that we really need to focus on and think about in addition to our external community. So we're gonna end there. Again, thank you everybody and good night. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. <laughs>